My name's Margaret, Margaret Walters. And this evening I am presenting to you um, some, a little bit of an introduction to the thought of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Now this is part of the, the ongoing series that um, Colleen Lissimer and Reverend Bill have been putting on and I've been helping out a little bit. So this is continuing on with the theme of uh, God's presence in creation, in nature. And uh, as we move into Teilhard tonight, you'll, you'll see how uh, fitting it is to, to speak about him. So uh, Teilhard uh, was really a genius and a very complex thinker. And so all I can hope to do tonight is to uh, give you a little inkling of what he's about. And I hope you enjoy it. So I'm going to now share my screen and uh, what I have prepared uh, a little PowerPoint presentation. So we're going to do that for 20 minutes perhaps. And then I want to tell you a story to conclude uh, the presentation tonight. So I'm going to go now to the PowerPoint. Wonderful. So I called this presentation Creation Becoming, the vision of Théa de Chardin. Uh, it seems to capture uh, a kind of an overall theme of, of Teilhard's that creation right from the beginning, from the Big Bang on, is, is becoming more and more. Um, I think that perhaps uh, I need to plant two little ideas in your mind at the beginning here so that it might make sense of the presentation as we watch it. And um, the first one is that for, for Teilhard, everything is a process of wanting. I've kind of pinched that word from Richard Raw's new book because wanting perfectly describes the process that Teilhard believed that we, we were all in process of. We're all wanting, not just human beings, but the whole universe for Teilhard is wanting. Uh, the other <clears throat> excuse me, the other uh, central idea, main idea of Teilhard is that this process of wanting can only come about through the power of love. So love is a universal energy for Teilhard. It's not a sentimental thing and it's not a property of uh, the human race, but it is a property of the universe. And so the energy of love is what enables all the wanting to happen. And so we have this uh, beautiful idea of uh, right from the beginning until the end, there is a process of uh, what Teilhard called divinization. He would always make up lots of words, where we are all becoming one with God until we, uh, in the end, we are uh, just united so completely with God that everything is one. So I wanted to just uh, share this beautiful slide with you because again, it captures Teilhard's vision. So you have a human being staring in wonder at the cosmos. And for Teilhard, this is the very special gift of human beings is their capacity to wonder, to reflect. Their self-reflective consciousness is, um, one of the great step forwards uh, in the universe is becoming, because now the universe can reflect back on itself. And that was one of Teilhard's great insights. He was really a seed thinker for many, many people who speak about this cosmic spirituality today. He was kind of the first one to have this vision. And so, the human being is, is helping the universe in its wanting process to, towards divinization, to becoming one with God. So who is this fellow? Um, he was a, a Frenchman 
born into the sort of minor aristocratic family, a very devout Catholic family he was raised in, and uh, he became a Jesuit and a priest um, in his early 20s. And um, you might know that the Jesuit order is very scholarly, and so you could be uh, both a priest and a scholar if you were a Jesuit, and Teilhard chose to go into science, and he became actually a very famous paleontologist. So he was always um, immersed in the earth, looking for signs of the ancient past. And he was a renowned psychologist of his time. He was born 1881 and died in 1955. He wanted to unify science and religion. That was his dream but he was rejected by both. In some ways, uh, Teilhard had a very tragic life. He was so far ahead of his time that nobody understood him. And the two uh, bodies that he loved the most really didn't understand him. And he was marginalized by both. He was silenced by his order, that his ideas were far too advanced for them. And, um, he was exiled away from France and spent uh, most of his life uh, in China. And at the end of his life, he, he was sent to New York where he died in 1955. So Teilhard had a vision as big as the universe. It's a rather mind blowing vision, I must warn you. Uh, but uh, it's almost like we are gradually catching up with this uh, immense uh, vision that Teilhard had. I should mention to you that De Teilhard survived two world wars. He was a stretcher bearer in the First World War and even surrounded by the terrible, terrible suffering and violence of the age that he lived in. He still had this uh, great vision of the uh, continual unification of uh, the human race, the, the earth and the whole universe. So he was hardly a Pollyanna thinker. He, he knew that uh, this journey was uh, a journey of suffering as well as great joy. So for Teilhard, the beginning of the cosmos, the Big Bang, was the beginning of the journey of the universe towards its fulfillment. So he was a scientist, but he also had a spiritual vision. So his, his, this vision is influenced both by science and uh, spirituality. And so he saw the universe moving towards its great fulfillment of oneness with God, continually unifying. He saw this journey as a metamorphosis where the most primitive stuff of the cosmos gradually, slowly unfolded into higher levels of being. To start with uh, stars forming and then stars becoming galaxies. And then eventually on earth, the uh, plasma and the rocks forming into a solid body and so the very, very primitive um, earthly formation with the rocks and the oceans and then uh, unfolding into plants and, and then animal life and gradually, eventually human beings. So it, for him, it was a, a metamorphosis that was uh, leading to greater complexity greater unity and greater love. The self-reflexive consciousness of humans is being transformed into a more compassionate, unified, loving version of itself through the action of the spirit. So we have to remember that in terms of the universe, we are still very, very young, uh, still becoming and despite the tremendous crises that we face as, as a human race, 
Teilhard felt that we had it in us to, to overcome uh, our difficulties and to become uh, more and more unified and more loving. Perhaps we really need this vision at this time. So for Teilhard, human beings uh, are not separate from the earth or from the cosmos, but they are uh, one of its latest products. And so for him, spirituality was as much to do with uh, earth, uh, the matter of the earth, as it is with, uh, with human beings. So he, he was absolutely in love with the earth and saw it as a, a manifestation of uh, God's presence. And one of his famous sayings is, there is communion with God and communion with the earth and communion with God through the earth. So you have to remember he lived uh, at a time when um, the Christian church was in many ways very dualistic. It was as if uh, the material world didn't really matter very much. And we all had our eyes focused on heaven and spiritual values. And so uh, Teod was again uh, far ahead of his time when he said, no, no, everything is all one. We value uh, the material. It is the, the home of the spiritual. It is all one. And so he thought that you could have communion with God through the earth. It wasn't just a, a spiritual journey for him. And, and so as we've said, it's, it started off with the, um, the rocks who, uh, who really are our ancestors. And Teilhard believed that everything right from the very beginning of, of the cosmos had its own, uh, what he called consciousness, which is kind of a strange word for us to hear because we always associate consciousness with human thinking. But what Teod meant is everything had its own inner reality. Um, indigenous spirituality echoes this. It's, it's it, even the mountains, the rocks, the rivers, water, the trees, they all have their own inner essence, their own inner reality, uh, their own inner consciousness. And for Teod, it was just all gradually unfolding to higher and higher levels of unity and consciousness. So after the, the mountains, then uh, the, the plant life covered the earth uh, and all the, the amazing beauty that were, was produced through the trees and the flowers all the, the gorgeousness of the plant life of the earth. Again, for Teo, this is a step forward in complexity and unity and consciousness. And then the animal life. So every aspect of nature has its own sacred resonance. It's not that um, anything is better than anything else. Even though Teod saw that human beings uh, were, had a very special place in this journey of metamorphosis. He didn't see them as better than. He didn't have an arrogant way of looking at human beings. They are simply the universe doing something else. Now, now the universe is expressing itself in a new way, a more complex way, a more unified, a more conscious way. And so with the appearance of human beings, it's like we're taking another a giant step forward towards the final unity that uh, Teilhard dreamt of. In, in terms of his own religious faith, um, Teilhard was very influenced by certain uh, passages of scripture. And I just want to read you one of them because it was really this that formed uh, the center of his spiritual vision. So Romans 8. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subject to fut futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, 
in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labour pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So you can see how this was so meaningful to Teilhard, that he sees that the whole of creation is, uh, is in the act of labour. It's giving birth. Uh, it's giving birth to itself. It's giving birth to its, its future self, its fulfilment, its oneness with, with God. So again, human beings are not on a journey by themselves. It is the whole of creation that uh, waits with eager longing uh, for the fulfillment that comes through love. Again, it's always for Teilhard, everything happens through the power of love. This is, um, it's very fitting that it's Advent when we're speaking about this, because really the whole of Teilhard's thinking is Advent thinking. The way he looks uh, from the beginning of time to the end of time in one big sweep, um, it's very reminiscent of an, of an Advent journey. So for him, the incarnation, God taking flesh began at the beginning of time, at the Big Bang. That's when God became present, became uh, the flesh of the universe, if you like. And this, this presence has been unfolding over time. And so uh, when Jesus is born, we see he is the historical incarnation of the Christ who always was and always will be. His birth brought a great leap forward for the cosmos. And again, one of the verses that Teilhard loved, the prologue of John, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And so, Christ existed at the beginning of time. Jesus was a historical manifestation of the Christ. And the Christ continues on with journeying with the universe. We are the body of Christ, journeying onwards to reach uh, our full maturity until we reach what Teilhard called Omega or the Omega point, which is the fullness of God. The omega point, if you can imagine that our Advent journey, um, at the end of time when God is all in all and everything is immersed in God. This is one of um, Teilhard's most famous sayings. And again, he's speaking about the power of love and what it can do. Someday, after mastering winds, waves, tides and gravity, we shall harness the energy of love. And for the second time in the history of the world, humanity will have discovered fire. It's like for Teilhard that love is luring us onward it's it's like it's like the fullness of love which exists at the end of time is already exerting an influence on on us luring us into more and more um, higher and higher levels if you like of love of consciousness of beauty and truth and all of the things that we know are the most important things in the world and so God is luring us into the future and it, it speaks of a suffering, fire speaks of a suffering. It speaks of crisis, but Teod thought that crisis was necessary in order that human beings would continue on in their journey, constantly seeking 
um, more, more being, more love, more consciousness. This is um, one of his prayers. I should mention that uh, Teot's most famous book is um, The Human Phenomenon. We used to call it The Phenomenon of Man, which um, Teot was not, not allowed to uh, publish anything while he was alive. But after his death, there was a kind of explosion onto the world, the uh, early 60s of his book, um, The Phenomenon of Man, and everybody was reading it at that point. And then it, everything went quiet for a while, but now everyone's reading it again. And now we have a lovely new translation, The Human Phenomenon by Sarah Appleton Weber. This, this quote that I have in front of you is from another of his famous books on spirituality, which was called The Divine Milieu. So we are all immersed, humans, but the universe, everything is immersed uh, in God, and so it is the divine milieu that, that we are all living in. And this is one of his prayers from the divine milieu. Lord, we know and feel that you are everywhere around us. Let the light of your face shine upon us in its universality. Send us your spirit whose flaming action alone can operate the birth and achievement of the great metamorphosis towards which your creation yearns. Yearning is very big in Teilhard's thinking. And he also said in that same book, however vast the divine milieu may be, it is in reality a center, the absolute and final power to unite and complete all beings within its breast. In the divine milieu, all the elements of the universe touch each other by that which is most inward and ultimate in them. So for Teilhard, everything has uh, an inwardness, an essence, where it is most, uh, most itself, where its being is most complete. And it's when these centers touch one another, that the unity is formed through the power of love. And of course, this is all a very slow process. And much as we are impatient to have it all done in our lifetime, uh, it moves very slowly as all uh, enormous things do. And so Teilhard asks us to trust in God and to be patient. Above all, trust in the slow work of God. So I'm going to stop sharing now and I'm going to just finish by telling you a story. I have to change my glasses. So this story was written by Jean Houston. And uh, she is uh, in her own right, uh, a famous author, speaker, presenter, and she works particularly within the realm of human potential. And she had the extraordinary experience of meeting Teilhard de Chardin when she was a teenager. And she tells the story and she, it's a most moving story. When I was about 14, I was seized by enormous waves of grief over my parents' breakup. I had read somewhere that running would help dispel anguish. So I began to run to school every day down Park Avenue in New York City. I was a great big overgrown girl, five feet 11 by the age of 11. One day I ran into a rather frail old gentleman in his seventies and knocked the wind out of him. He laughed as I helped him to his feet and asked me in French accented speech, are you planning to run like that for the rest of your life? Yes, sir, I replied, it looks that way. Well, bon voyage, he said, 
Bon voyage, I answered and sped on my way. About a week later, I was walking down Park Avenue with my fox terrier champ. And again, I met the old gentleman. Ah, he greeted me, my friend, the runner and with a fox terrier. I knew one like that years ago in France. Where are you going? Well, sir, I replied, I'm taking Champ to Central Park. I will go with you, he informed me. I will take my constitutional. And thereafter, for about a year or so, the old gentleman and, and I would meet and walk together often, several times a week in Central Park. He had a long French name, but asked me to call him by the first part of it, which was Mr. Taylor, as far as I could make out. The walks were magical and full of delight. Not only did Mr. Taylor seem to have absolutely no self-consciousness, but he was always being seized by wonder and astonishment over the simplest things. He was constantly and literally falling in love. I remember one time when he suddenly fell on his knees, his long Gallic nose raking the ground and exclaimed to me, Jean, look at the caterpillar. Ah, I joined him on the ground to see what had evoked so profound a response that he was seized by the essence of caterpillar. How beautiful it is, he remarked, this little green being with its wonderful, funny little feet, exquisite, little furry body, little green feet on the road to metamorphosis. He then regarded me with equal delight. Jean, can you feel yourself to be a caterpillar? Oh yes, I replied with the baleful knowing of a gangly, pimply-faced teenager. Then think of your own metamorphosis, he suggested. What will you be when you become a butterfly? Une papillon, eh? What is the butterfly of Jean? What a wonderful question for a 14-year-old girl. His long, gothic, comic, tragic face would nod with wonder. Eh, Jeanne, look at the clouds, God's calligraphy in the sky. All that transforming, moving, changing, dissolving, becoming. Jeanne, become a cloud and become all the forms that ever were. It was wonderful. People of all ages followed us around laughing, not at us, but with us. Old Mr. Taylor was truly diaphanous to every moment and being with him was like being in attendance at God's own party, a continuous celebration of life and its mysteries. But mostly Mr. Taylor was so full of vital sap and juice that he seemed to flow with everything. Always he saw the interconnections between things the way that everything in the universe, from fox terriers to tree bark to somebody's red hat to the mind of God, was related to everything else and was very, very good. He wasn't merely a great appreciator, engaged by all his senses. He was truly penetrated by the reality that was yearning for him as much as he was yearning for it. He talked to the trees, to the wind, to the rocks, as dear friends, as beloved even. Ah, my friend, the Mika Schistleia, do you remember when? And I would swear that the Mika Schist would begin to glitter back. I mean, Mika Schist will do that, but on a cloudy day. Everything was treated as personal, as sentient, as thou. And everything that was thou was ensouled with being, and it thoued back to him. So when I walked with him, I felt as though a spotlight was following us, bringing radiance and light everywhere. 
and I was constantly seized by astonishment in the presence of this infinitely beautiful man who radiated such sweetness, such kindness. The last time that I ever saw him was the Thursday before Easter Sunday, 1955. I brought him the shell of a snail. Ah, Iscago, he exclaimed, and then proceeded to wax ecstatic for the better part of an hour. Snail shells and galaxies and the convolutions in the brain, the whirl of flowers and the meanderings of rivers were taken up into a great hymn to the spiraling evolution of spirit and matter. When he had finished, his voice dropped and he whispered almost in prayer, Omega, Omega, Omega. Finally, he looked up and said to me quietly, Au revoir, Jean. Au revoir, Mr. Taylor, I, I replied. I'll meet you same time next Tuesday. For some reason, Champ, my fox terrier, didn't want to budge. And when I pulled him along, he whimpered, looking back at Mr. Taylor, his tail between his legs. The following Tuesday, I was there waiting where we always met at the corner of Park Avenue and 83rd Street. He didn't come. The following Thursday, I waited again. Still, he didn't come. The dog looked up at me sadly. For the next eight weeks, I continued to wait, but he never came again. It turned out that he had suddenly died that Easter Sunday, but I didn't find that out for years. Some years later, someone handed me a book without a cover, which was titled The Phenomenon of Man. As I read the book, I found it strangely familiar in its concepts. Occasional words and expressions loomed up as echoes from my past. When later in the book, I came across the concept of the Omega point, I was certain. I asked to see the jacket of the book looked at the author's picture and of course recognized him immediately. There was no forgetting or mistaking that face. Mr. Thayer was Teilhard de Chardin, the great priest scientist, poet and mystic. And during that lovely and luminous year, I had been meeting him outside the Jesuit rectory of St. Ignatius, where he was living most of the time. Teilhard had what few church officials did, the power and grace of the love that passes all understanding. He could write about love being the evolutionary force, the omega point that lures the world and ourselves into becoming, because he experienced that love in a piece of rock, in the wag of a dog's tail, in the eyes of a child. He was so in love with everything that he talked in great particularity, even to me as an adolescent, about the desire atoms have for each other, the yearning of molecules, of organisms, of bodies, of planets, of galaxies, all of creation, longing for that radi radiant bonding, for joining, for the deepening of their condition, for becoming more by virtue of yearning for and finding the other. He knew about the search for the beloved. His model was Christ. For Théard de Chardin, Christ was the beloved of the soul. Years later, while addressing some Jesuits, a very old Jesuit came up to me. He was a friend of Théard's and he told me how Théard used to talk of his, his encounters in the park with a girl called Jeanne. I love that story because it's like a mini course in Théard de Chardin and I couldn't say anything better than uh, Jean Houston has said it. So I hope you've enjoyed this little taste of Théard de Chardin and I hope that it might um, give you an appetite to uh, discover more of his work. 
And so uh, I wish you a very happy Advent and may love lure you into more and more becoming.